Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 286th episode, we have a bunch of news, including a brand new Ceratopsian. So if you're a fan of Triceratops and its relatives, you should be excited, or at least get excited. (laughs) And we also have some news about what Antarctica was like during the Cretaceous and some various outdoor activities people are doing related to dinosaurs. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Coronasaurus. We kind of had to. Especially for Sabrina, since she's been watching a lot of TikTok. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank Scotty, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Rhinosaurus, Morgan Eklov, Risa, Kelly, Manda, Laurasaurus, Timmy, James Pasco, Gabe, TRX Dinosaurs, and Michael. Yeah, thank you so much to all of our patrons. We say it every week, but we really do mean it. We really appreciate all of your support, and we've been enjoying watching movies with all of you on every Saturday the last few weeks, the dinosaur movies. So if you want to join this growing community and get in on that movie watching with us, then join our Patreon at patreon.com slash I Dino. Jumping into the news, up first is our new Ceratopsian. It was published in Royal Society Open Science by John Wilson and others, and in it, they describe a new dinosaur named Stellosaurus ancillae. Oh, this is the one named after David Bowie? Sort of, yeah. So Stellosaurus translates directly to star lizard, and in the description they say it's, quote, in reference to the overall star-like appearance of the cranial ornamentation and in homage to the song Starman by David Bowie, end quote. So it's like one of those double namings. But the first mention is that it's star-shaped, so I guess it's more that. But then they also really like the song Starman, so they kind of tack that on, <laughs> it seems like. And then Ancelay is after Carrie Ansel, who discovered and prepared the holotype over 30 years ago. And she also discovered and prepared lots of other material in this and other papers. A lot of it's Ceratopsians cool. from the area. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice when preparators get credit because that's so much work. It is. It's a crazy amount of work. Stellosaurus was found in the Two Medicine Formation in Montana about 75 million years ago. Well, it wasn't found 75 million years ago. It was alive 75 million years ago. (laughs) The paper actually revises a few centrosaurines. Usually, centrosaurines are the ceratopsians that don't have the big brow horns like triceratops, but instead have one large nasal horn, and then they have fancier frills like styracosaurus with all the extra horn-like things sticking out of the edge rather than having the ones above their eyes. And in this case, luckily, all of the ones we're going to talk about meet that general description because there are some centrosaurians that don't, but they all have that same sort of fancy frill, big nose horn, not much for the what they call post-orbital horns, but the horns above the eyes. And the horns above the eyes are like the ones you see in triceratops, right? Yeah. So this is not like a triceratops. It's like the opposite. It's more like a rhino with a big nose horn. With Stellosaurus, as is usually the case with Ceratopsians, they didn't find any of its body at all whatsoever. Zero bones, not even a single rib or toe bone or anything. But they did find some of its head (laughs) because apparently that usually got left alone and often fossilized. It's big. Maybe it didn't get disturbed as much during the fossilization process. Probably wasn't as tasty. Specifically in this case, they're talking about a find known as MOR-492. Oh, Museum of the Rockies. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> and they named MOR-492 to a holotype. And it's interesting because the holotype, like I said, it just has pieces of the skull, but they basically found all the most important bits of the skull, not much else. <laughs> so they got pretty lucky with what they found. It included a couple of tiny horns above the eyes, little bitty bumps, like smaller maybe even than the brow bumps above a T-Rex eyes. They're really small. They also have an enormous nasal horn, super massive compared to the rest of the skull, like sticks up maybe even past the frill. That's how tall it was. And they have the horns from the edge of the frill. And I should probably mention that technically they're not horns when they're on the edge of the frill. They call them processes. And depending on where they are on the frill, they can be like epiosifications and things. But I'm just going to call them all horns because that's easier. And you know what I'm talking about. As usual, They assume that the horns on the frill are symmetric on each side. And in this case, there are two pairs of long horns sticking up kind of out of the top on the corners. So if you take two peace signs in your hands and you put them like 
on the corners of your forehead so that they're sticking up sort of like a pair of bunny ears. That's <laughs> This is funny to watch you do this. Yeah. So this is kind of what it looks like. Sabrina can see me. No one else can. But yeah, if you take two peace signs and stick them up on the sides of your head, that's sort of what the horn sticking out of its head look like. And that's what gave it a star name, too, because they're sort of sticking out like rays radiating away from the head, like a star pattern. Not like bunny ears. No, I mean, it's like double bunny ears <laughs> on both sides. And then if you're going to be Styracosaurus, you could do the same thing, but just do four fingers on each hand. So it's just like a double ornamented one. Although the two that are farther down the head now would be a lot smaller. So they're the tallest on the top. And then they got smaller as they went down on Styracosaurus. I feel like you could do good shadow puppets. <laughs> with these. Mm -hmm. And there's also, there are other Ceratopsians that just have like three, some that only have one. So there's every variant that you can imagine of these horns. And then they also curve in all sorts of different directions. But in the case of Stellosaurus, they basically point straight out. They're not very curved. Stella. With Stellosaurus, all of the horns farther down the frill are really small. They're like Triceratops kind of small where they just kind of make little tiny bumps. Sort of like if you cut the frill with pinking shears you know what those are? If you're a crafter, I guess. <laughs> yeah, kind of leaves just a wavy pattern rather than a straight line. Since I think the most exciting characteristic of Stellosaurus is its nasal horn, I should point out how big it is. It sticks up at least 40 centimeters or about 16 inches from the skull or from the snout <laughs> as it is. But that doesn't include any of the keratin covering, which probably covered it. And a while back, we talked about how that could increase the size of horns like this by 30% or 50% or maybe even doubled the size of it. So it could have easily been over two feet long, and that's approaching rhino-sized horn on its face. But I didn't realize rhinos have really enormous horns. Sometimes they get up to like four feet long. Wow. So yeah, it's hard to compete with rhinos, but the, these guys were, were starting to get there at least. Rhinos don't have cool frills, though, So the and these guys have the extra horns up there, too, so yeah. they're cooler. So they, did, they had to spend all their energy growing on the frills, not yeah. just the horn. Yeah, they had a lot more going on. The specimen that the holotype is named after is considered a young adult, so it probably would have grown a lot larger, and then depending on if this horn was like a sexual display feature, it might have grown proportionally much more compared to the rest of it because a lot of these display structures really get going as the animal gets bigger. So it could have been rhino size. Yeah. We, we don't know. We only have the one. And the horn that we have is kind of compressed laterally, or in other words, it's kind of thin, like a dorsal fin in that sort of direction. But I don't know. Every time there's just one individual case of a horn and then it's like, oh, this one's unusual because it's compressed. It's like we only have what, you know, like every other species has a more round nasal horn. It could have just been compressed during fossilization, it seems like to me. Another interesting thing in the paper is that because MOR 492 had previously been used, I think in 2010, to split out a Styracosaurus individual into a new genus of Rubeosaurus, when they used this same material to make Stellosaurus, and they pulled it out of Rubeosaurus. The only thing left in Rubeosaurus was the original Styracosaurus ovatus material, which Charles Gilmore named way back in 1930. So these authors are saying Rubeosaurus is gone because Rubeosaurus was just a combination of Styracosaurus and Stellosaurus pieces that shouldn't have been combined to make a new dinosaur. So they're saying get rid of Rubeosaurus, bring back Styracosaurus ovatus with part of the material that Rubeosaurus was named after, and then the other piece becomes this new dinosaur, Stellosaurus. So it kind of mixed up some other dinosaurs when they named this one as well. That happens. It does. It happens quite a bit. The other interesting thing with this paper is one of the article keywords is anagenesis, and we've talked about that before. That's the direct evolution of one species into another. Some people talk about how maybe Triceratops directly evolved, but in any case, it's the idea that one specific species might go extinct and evolve into another species, just like straight down that evolutionary pathway, which is super hard to prove. But it's been proposed before that Styracosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus might have been on the sort of continuum with Aeneasaurus in between. And when we split out Stellosaurus, it also fits into that. So now there's this crazy five-part 
piece of anagenesis that might have happened. And it would basically be starting with Styracosaurus about 75 million years ago, evolving into Stellosaurus, then Ineosaurus, then Achaeloosaurus, and finally Pachyrhinosaurus. And that all would have happened <laughs> within like 3 million years. So it's like 75 million years ago, you're at Styracosaurus, and then just a few million years ago, all the way through that whole series into Pachyrhinosaurus. That seems quick. It's crazy quick. If that did happen, they're evolving really fast for a dinosaur. But there were so there was such crazy ceratopsian diversity going on in the late Cretaceous that it's possible that they were evolving that fast. Even if they weren't evolving that fast, there was just a lot of different ornamentation evolving in different branches of the ceratopsian family tree. So it would have been quite the place to be, I think. But it's, I think it's pretty unlikely that those five directly evolved from one another because, oh man, anagenesis is so hard to prove. Yeah, there always seems to be missing links. Yep. I think the main thing here is that they're all in the same formation and they're so tight together in age that it makes it seem like, oh, they could just be evolving. I'm sure there are some people that think some of these are just juvenile versions of others because the horns are in different places and different sizes and things. Or it could just be individual variation, too. So for some of them are females and some are males, there's a lot of different ways to explain this. Or some are juveniles, some are adults. Yep. And in other news, a paper published in Nature by Johan Klages, I think, and about a million other people. <laughs> Not literally a million. A lot of other people. It ends with the science team of Expedition PS-104, when I don't even know how many people might be in, in that group. But yeah, a lot of people were involved in this paper. And it's all about the climate that was going on in the Antarctic 83 to 92 million years ago, also known as the late Cretaceous. We've talked before about how in the Mesozoic, especially in the Cretaceous, it was a lot warmer. Carbon dioxide levels were much higher. And as a result, the sea level was way higher. If you're wondering how much higher carbon dioxide concentrations were in the late Cretaceous, the estimates are about a thousand parts per million, which is about two and a half times today's number and about four times pre-industrial levels. So people expect that there was a lot of greenhouse effect going on, really keeping everything all toasty. But we didn't have much information from the Antarctic itself. It's all just been assumed from other parts of the Earth. So these researchers just collected some drill core samples from Antarctica in rock that's between 83 and 92 million years old. And when I say just collected, I think it was actually in 2017, but it takes a while to get it out, get it to a lab, section it, and then actually get some results out of it. The area they sampled from is now considered the southernmost known Cretaceous formation anywhere on Earth. It was 82 degrees south at the time that it formed, which was only about 900 kilometers or 600 miles from the Paleo South Pole. And obviously the South Pole is at 90 degrees south, so 8 degrees. And the closer you're out of the poles, the closer those degrees are. So yeah, they're really close to the South Pole from where this was sampled. Fortunately for the researchers, now it's a little bit farther from the South Pole, which made it a lot easier to sample. It's just basically right off the edge of the main landmass of Antarctica. It's still not that easy. <laughs> no, it's really not. But one thing that made it a little bit easier is that they had this fancy robotic seafloor drilling rig. So they didn't have to go through ice. They basically were in a boat and then they put this little drilling rig thingy that went down to the seafloor and took out a little bit of rock and brought it back up. Unfortunately for them, the water is way deeper than where the other team we talked about drilled at the Chicxulub impact ring. I think the Chicxulub ring was something like 50 to 100 feet deep. Here it is 3,100 feet deep, wow. <laughs> 946 meters. So way, way down there. But on the other hand, they didn't have to drill that far into the seafloor to get to the rock they wanted. They only had to go down about 30.7 meters or 101 feet below the seafloor. And what they found was that after some layers of glacier sediment and a little bit of more recent rock, they got to about a three meter segment of late Cretaceous rock. Like I said before, that was aged to about 83 to 92 million years ago. And they figured that out based on pollen that was fossilized in there because they know that some of the pollen went extinct 93 million years ago. And some of the other pollen didn't show up until 83 million years ago, but that was absent. So you can date it as that in between, based on what plants were around at the time. 
And as a quick fun fact, Zealandia was separating from Antarctica around this time, that 90 million years ago-ish time, although it was still fully submerged. And Zealandia is the continent which New Zealand is on. And it is now considered a continent by most people. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So now we've technically been to five of eight continents. I think so. I think there might actually be a couple others because like India is sort of on a continent. Oh, I thought it was considered a subcontinent. Yeah, I'm not sure. Science is like that. It's hard to keep up. <laughs> well, the continents are also slowly changing. That's true. But back to Antarctica. In these core samples, they also found some fossil roots in what is basically mudstone. So under a microscope, what they found was that it looks like the roots were growing and doing pretty well there, which means they didn't get washed in. And therefore, there were these root-having plants in Antarctica at the time. And based on chemical signatures and the pollen, they figure that it was probably a freshwater swamp. Just proof that the continents are always changing. Yes. <laughs> and changing quite a bit from Antarctica being a freshwater swamp to being covered in ice. And based on the pollen, too, they can tell that it included conifers and other quote-unquote forest-type vegetation. So it's a good place to be as an herbivore. Yeah. Hopefully during the six months of darkness that it went through, the plants still had enough on them to be eaten by the herbivores. They probably had some mechanism to survive. Yeah. Yeah, I really wonder. They had a lot of ferns. I don't know how ferns do in the dark. I think some of them can handle a pretty low light. The researchers also used what's called climate reconstruction analysis using coexistence likelihood estimation, or crackle, <laughs> which is just fun to say. And they use that to estimate the climate using the known plant life. So basically, if you knew it had all these certain trees and things that would only survive in certain climates, you can kind of guess at what the temperature would have to be for them to be alive there. What they came up with was that the mean annual temperature was probably around 13 degrees Celsius or 55 degrees Fahrenheit, which puts it at just a little bit warmer than London or Seattle. And they also guessed that the precipitation would have been around 112 centimeters a year or 44 inches a year. And that makes it a little more rainy than Seattle and a lot more rainy than London. So it wasn't incredibly hot. It was just kind of like a warm swamp, I guess, not like a real hot bayou type swamp. They also used some models to see how much carbon dioxide would be needed to get the earth basically to that temperature where Antarctica, rather than having ice on it, was covered in plants. And using a pre-industrial carbon dioxide level of 280 parts per million, they ran models at 1x, 2x, 4x, and 6x of pre-industrial levels meaning 280, 560, 1,120, and 1,680 parts per million of carbon dioxide. And they found that the climate was kind of in between the two highest ones, so in between 1,100 and 1,700 ppm of carbon dioxide, which is crazy high, obviously. In that model, they also found that an ice cap was extremely unlikely, so it would have just been forested all the time. It's not like there would have been periodic ice in the winter or anything. It's just so much warmer. Yep. And the sea level was so much higher. <laughs> but that's good if you're a dinosaur. Yeah, I guess. Less good if you're a person living in an area that was underwater back then, like most of California, <laughs> <laughs> including our house. You think we didn't have to worry about it? Hopefully not. In other news, in Argentina, scientists from the Natural History Museum of Argentina recently found fossils of what they're calling a mega raptor that lived 70 million years ago was found in the Santa Cruz province. And they found vertebrae ribs and part of the chest and shoulder. It's a new species and large, about 33 feet or 10 meters long, and it had a long tail and long muscular arms with big claws that were up to 15.7 inches or 40 centimeters long. I don't think they published about this yet, though. That's so cool. Yeah, I was surprised I missed it. But I guess it's just the, the early phases of the publication, not the official peer review. The announcement. Good old Mega Raptor. Yeah. 16-inch claw. Jeez. Yes, it's large. It's getting up near Therizinosaurus sort of territory. Mm, maybe it's another really weird dinosaur. Well, they're calling it a Mega Raptor. I wonder if it's going to get a new species name or if it's just another individual of Mega Raptor because it had those crazy big finger claws too. It's Mega Raptor in quotes. I don't think anything's decided yet. Hmm. 
On a different note, Dinosaur National Monument on the Western Slope is now partially reopened and people can hike and walk the park. So the roads and the trails are open, but visitor centers, dinosaur quarry, exhibit hall, campgrounds, and river trips are still closed. And also drinking water is not available and access to restrooms is limited. So if you are thinking about hiking or walking there, they're saying check the park website to learn about its operating status. But if the quarry exhibit hall is closed, that's really the the main event there. That's true. So you'd probably be disappointed if you trekked all the way out there. I would be at least. But we've been, we have pictures. If you're interested in seeing, that's on our website. Yeah, and they have that digital version so you can explore it. It's not really the same as being next to the massive wall of bones, though. It's a really cool place. In Beatrice, Nebraska, Community Players, which is a theater, had an online viewing of Dinosaur Vacation, which is a show that Community Players Associate Artistic Director Tyler Wren wrote when he was in the fourth grade. And it's about five boys. They get a mysterious offer to go to a prehistoric land, and then they have to escape and solve mysteries. And it's apparently full of T-Rex and Jeep chases and Velociraptor duels. He says he was inspired by Jurassic Park. (laughs) Yeah, I could see that. (laughs) T-Rex, Jeep chases, and Velociraptors. Yep. In Ferndale, Michigan, there's a T-Rex walking club, and people there walk through neighborhoods unannounced, and they're wearing inflatable costumes. So there's people in the T-Rex costumes, but there's also bears, zebras, unicorns, hippos, and giraffes, and other things. Hmm. And so everyone in the parade, they wear a mask, and then all the tails pretty much keep them six feet apart, and they walk single file to songs like Walk the Dinosaur and Walk Like an Egyptian. Hmm. It's a good way to spread some cheer. And last, Nerdist reported about Matthew Cosman, who's a dad and engineer, and he built a 48-foot dinosaur playground jungle gym in his backyard for his kids. And he modeled the dinosaur on a potosaurus. Nice. And then he built everything himself. So the jungle gym's 48 feet long, 12 feet high. It weighs around 3,500 pounds, and that's without the footing because there's 20... Yeah, there's 24,000 pounds of concrete to keep the dinosaur stable and standing. (laughs) Sounds like something an engineer would put together. Yeah. Yeah. So he used steel, aluminum, and other materials that he's apparently been collecting for years. And he used a crane to take pieces from his workshop to his home. Oh, there's also LED lights so his kids can play there at night. Oh, man. And it's got a rock climbing area, swings, monkey bars, and a small ropes course. Wow. That sounds really cool. It looks epic and a lot of fun. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Coronasaurus. So we've noticed a lot of people lately dressing as dinosaurs and calling themselves Coronasaurus. And Coronasaurus is a real dinosaur and actually has nothing to do with coronavirus or COVID-19. I should say it's Coronosaurus. If it was Coronasaurus, it would be Coronasaura, probably. Oh. Because that'd be the feminine version. Good point. So Coronosaurus was a centrosaurine ceratopsian, lots of ceratopsians in this episode, that lived in the late Cretaceous and what's now Alberta, Canada, in the Oldman Formation. It was described in 2005, first as Centrosaurus brinkmani, by Michael Ryan and Anthony Russell. And then in 2012, it was named Coronosaurus brinkmani by Michael Ryan, David Evans, and Kieran Shepard. It looks like it was slightly older than Styracosaurus, too but it was also really close in age to the dinosaurs we were talking about earlier. So the genus name means crowned lizard, and corona is Latin for crown. And it's named because of the crown-like shape of the horns on its frill, but Michael Ryan also said that he thought the hook clusters that were on the frill looked like the corona of the sun. That's the outermost part of the sun's atmosphere, and you can see it during a total solar eclipse, and it looks wispy. Astronomers can also see it using coronagraphs, which are telescopes that block out direct sunlight from a star so you can see the things close to it. Yeah, coronavirus is named after the sun's corona part two, because if you look at it under certain microscopes, it has this sort of hazy appearance around the edges of it, just like the sun does if you're using the right techniques. So that's the only thing the two have in common. The only thing. The Latin for corona which relates to the sun or a crown. (laughs) Other than that, there's no relation. (laughs) So back to Coronosaurus and its crown-like shape of the horns on its frill. That's unique because most ceratopsians have individual horns or spikes on their frills, but Coronosaurus has a cluster. So it had a large frill and many horns on its head. 
It had brow horns over the eyes, a large nasal horn, and some spikes or ossifications on the frill that look like a crown. And these ossifications are two clusters of curved hooks, some point forward and some point backwards. This may have been for display. Several specimens have been found, and younger Coronosaurus developed short spikes that fused into the clusters as it aged. Coronosaurus was medium-sized and estimated to be about 16 feet or 5 meters long and weigh about 2 tons. Phil Curry found the fossils in two bone beds between 1996 and 2000. The type and only species is Coronosaurus brinkmani, and the species name refers to Donald Brinkman for his research in paleoecology in Alberta in late Cretaceous environments. Michael Ryan was a grad student when he first described Coronosaurus, when he described it as Centrosaurus brinkmani, and he said in an Ottawa Citizen article, quote, my fellow graduate students used to tease me by calling it broccoli ceratops. <laughs> I have to say there was about 30 seconds when I actually considered calling it a broccoli ceratops. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. He also said in 2005, it, quote, appears indistinguishable from Centrosaurus apertus in all aspects of its anatomy, except for differences in its cranial ornamentation, the nasal, parietal, and postorbital horn cores. Yeah, that makes sense. Those are the main differences. It's all the ornamentation in these ceratopsians. Their bodies are all kind of similar, sort of like hadrosaurs. <laughs> Just sort of generic herbivore body plus crazy head. <laughs> so the change to coronasaurus in 2012 was based on a 2011 phylogenetic analysis that added new characters to the mix. So the result was Centrosaurus brinkmani and Centrosaurus apertus were no longer considered to be sister taxon, so then Centrosaurus brinkmani became Coronosaurus brinkmani. Uh, Michael Ryan, actually, we just heard, also recently named the Ceratopsian Stellosaurus because of the star-shaped fringe. All these star-based names that he's coming up with. Well, not just that. So in the Ottawa Citizen article, Jordan Mallon said, quote, it's funny because Michael is not a beer drinker, and yet he has named two dinosaurs after beers. I know Corona. What's the other one? Stella. Oh, Stella, that's true. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Coronasaurus probably lived on a coastal plain, and other dinosaurs that lived around the same place and time include the theropods, Sornitholestes, Displetosaurus, Troodon, Dromaeosaurus, and Hesperonychus. Also, ceratopsids, such as Alberta ceratops, Chasmosaurus, and Anchiceratops, Hadrosaurids, like Brachylophosaurus, Gryposaurus, Parasaurolophus, and Carithosaurus. The Thessalosaurid Alberta Dromaeus and the Ankylosaurid Scolosaurus. You can see a partial skull of Coronosaurus at the Royal Tyrol Museum. And for our fun fact of the day, it's been exactly 145 years to the day since the Meter Convention. So happy World Metrology Day. Garrett's giving me a look like this is a really big deal. <laughs> uh, I think it's pretty cool. It's every May 20th on the anniversary of the Meter Convention. What's the meter convention? It's basically when we were trying to get the whole world using the meter as a standard unit of measure and other standards unit of measure between countries. Well, that didn't work. It sort of, I mean, it did for most of the world. The U.S. officially signed it 100 years later in 1975, but we still haven't fully gotten around to it. But in celebration of World Metrology Day, I thought it'd be fun to go through an example of an adult T-Rex in various obscure units. So You're so pleased with yourself. I really enjoy weird units. They're one of my favorite things. So a T-Rex, as you may know, is about 12.3 meters long, also known as about 40 feet long, but that is also 120 hands long. There are three hands to a foot. All right. And it makes it about five lengths also known as horse lengths, because a horse length is eight feet, or 26.4 gunter's lengths. What are gunter's lengths? So a gunter's link comes from a gunter's chain, which was something that surveyors used to measure like acreage. And so there are 100 links in a chain, and a chain is 22 yards long or 66 feet. So one link is 7.92 inches long. And this was a standard that was used in Britain and the U.S. for hundreds of years. Wow. But going over to weight, because that's also really fun. An adult T-Rex weighs very roughly 10 metric tons, which is equivalent to 11 short tons. And short tons are based on 2,000 pounds per short ton. But it's also 9.84 long tons. 
I didn't know there was such a thing as a long ton. Yeah, long tons are based on hundred weight. There are <laughs> there are twenty hundred weight in a long ton, and a hundred weight is eight stone, which British people still use for measuring their own body weight because one stone is about fourteen pounds. So if you say you weigh ten stone, you weigh one hundred and forty pounds. So yeah, T Rex though is one hundred ninety seven long hundred weight because there's also short hundred weight, which is a different thing in the u.s and t-rex for comparison for any british people who know how much they weigh in stone the t-rex would have weighed 1575 stone that's a lot of stone it is but my all-time favorite way to measure a t-rex is in carrots and there are five carrots in a gram which means that one t-rex weighs about 50 million carrots that's so many yeah it's, it's an obscene way to measure a dinosaur is in carrots but that means if somebody ever asks you how big a T-Rex is, you can say, well, it's about 26.4 Gunter's lengths long and weighs about 50 million carats. <laughs> Only if you want to really confuse somebody, yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing to do on World Metrology Day, I think. And they say, what is that? And you say, well, thanks to World Metrology Day 145 years ago, instead we say it weighs 10 metric tons and is about 12.3 meters long. Okay. For anybody listening... <laughs> If anybody actually does this, please let us know and let us know the reaction of the person. Be really <laughs> curious. I can guess. I can guess what it might be. <laughs> Enjoyment and satisfaction in new knowledge? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one way to find out. <laughs> it's true. That was definitely Sabrina's reaction with me doing it just now. Yeah, Garrett was also extra pleased with himself, so I knew something was up. <laughs> And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks again for listening. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And you can also join our growing dinosaur enthusiast community at Patreon, patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again. And until next time.